Hello, good morning Year 10 and welcome to the um, final lesson on the forest under threat topic. So actually next week uh, we'll be starting topic 9 which is um, about energy. Obviously you can see we're doing a slightly different format today. I've got a new piece of software downloaded onto my computer um, and I thought you'd be missing my face. So um, we're trying to do it uh, through this slightly different, slightly different method. What you need to, to download is the Word document from Show My Homework Please and um, that is it, that's all you need for today's lesson. Um, obviously your exercise book as well. In the back of your exercise book, I'd like you to have a go at this do now task. So this is based on what we talked about last lesson. So I want you to write a definition for sustainable forest management. I would like you to give two examples of how that can be achieved through alternative farming methods. And I would like you to give two characteristics of ecotourism. Now you can do um, those things whilst the video is paused. Um, try and do them from memory, but if you do need to consult your notes um, and go back to yesterday's stuff, uh, then you can do that as well. So pause the video now and then press play when you're done. Okay, so let's take a look at your answers. So the first one asks you to write a definition for sustainable forest management. So remember, I said that it's really, really important that we can uh, define sustainability in various different contexts in geography, okay? So sustainable forest management is um, where a forest is used in a way that does not damage it such that it cannot be used by future generations. Okay, so, and that's the kind of really important point. Sustainability isn't about changing behavior so much that we can no longer use a resource, but it's about using a resource in a way that doesn't damage it permanently, okay? That doesn't damage it in a way that would stop future generations from being able to, to use it as well. So that's the answer to the first question. The second question, uh, what was it? Was to give two examples of how this can be achieved through alternative farming methods. So this is about finding different ways in which you can farm um, that are more sustainable, okay? Uh, that don't cause that, that permanent damage. Uh, so there's a couple of things you could have written about from yesterday. One of them was we talked about something called agroforestry. Okay, um, and this idea uh, of agroforestry was that you plant, you, you, uh, or um, kind of agro farming, was that you still plant crops, but you don't fell or clear an entire field, okay, or, or, or an entire um, area of the trees. You leave some trees in position. Okay, and the crops are growing in between, in between the trees. What that means is that you're still getting some of those ecosystem services from the trees. The roots are still binding the soil together and reducing soil erosion, uh, which means that the soils maintain their fertility um, for longer periods of time um, and therefore the crop growth is, is good um, and there is less of a, a loss of biodiversity. We also talked about crop rotation, didn't we, uh, yesterday? Um, as another method and this was the idea that you have let's say you've got multiple fields okay uh, that, are be, that are in use that where the trees have been have been cut down um, now two of them might be growing crops on them at any one time whilst the other is being allowed to recover and form kind of forest again all right um, and then in the next season it would be a different uh, field that's allowed to to regrow um, whilst crops exist on one of the others. So you're just constantly rotating um, the, the, the different kind of fields uh, that are being used for, uh, for crop growth whilst allowing time for, for uh, others to recover. The other kind of alternative livelihood, so, so a different way of um, generating uh, wealth and income and using resources in the tropical rainforest in a sustainable way. Um, wasn't just sustainable farming techniques like crop rotation and agroforestry, um, but was ecotourism, okay? Um, and the final Dunai question asked you to give some characteristics 
of ecotourism. Ecotourism um, minimizes damage to the environment. It's small scale. So only small numbers of tourists are, are kind of involved at any one time. As a result of that, it is quite expensive for those tourists. Um, it usually um, employs locals uh, directly, um, but also through some of the services and the cultural experiences that some of the local people might be able to offer. Um, and it's good that, that the wealth, therefore, remains in those um, in those localities rather than kind of being siphoned off to the CEO of big big businesses, as would happen in uh, in mass tourism uh, industries. Um, and also, it raises awareness. Okay. Of uh, of conservation issues and and the importance of the of the tropical rainforest. There's a, a kind of education element to those people that are going on these holidays. Um, but uh, but yeah, um, the kind of key point with ecotourism overall is that the, the forest uh, itself is lucrative. Um, it can make money by being forest, and that's the really important thing about uh, ecotourism. Whereas in many of the other ways in which we use the tropical rainforest to generate wealth, um, it's by getting rid of the forest and, and doing something else uh, in that location. Um, ecotourism is the opposite of that. It's making money out of the forest as, as a forest. Okay, so what I would like us to, uh, to do today then is write the date and title in the front of our exercise books. Um, and this is the... Um, the title. Obviously, I'm recording this on Tuesday, but you need, might need to write a different date. So, should the tiger be protected or exploited? Um, and what we want to look at today is this um, idea that, um, as with the tropical rainforest, we know that um, it's it's hard work trying to um, come up with ways to, to manage them sustainably and to, to look after uh, these forests. Um, so, what we need to think about is, well, um, what methods do exist? Okay, what what can we do in the tropical rainforest? Um, oh, sorry, the the tiger forest in this lesson, the bo or the boreal forest. Um, what can we do, uh, and why is it a challenge? The interesting thing about the tiger forest is that some people actually disagree. Um, you'll be it's, it's quite hard to find people that can kind of passionately disagree that we should protect the tropical rainforest. But some people actually argue that we should exploit the tiger at a faster rate, that we should do more and keep exploiting it. So we'll be looking at that towards the end of the lesson. Um, but yeah, those are kind of key things. What can we do to protect uh, the tiger? Why is the tiger difficult to protect? Um, and why do people disagree about whether or not we should even protect the tiger in the first place? Which takes me on to my kind of like point, uh, you know, why does the tiger uh, need protecting? Um, and I just think that if you think about where the tiger is, so and you look at the top of this um, this map here, so most of the tiger forest or the boreal forest is in is in Russia, parts of Scandinavia, um, and in Canada. All right. Now many of those pressures that were used as a justification for exploiting the tropical rainforest, so like poverty, for instance, or uh, population growth, meaning that you, there was more land was required. Those pressures don't really exist in the taiga. These are, uh, are generally wealthier uh, communities, and they are more remote communities. Um, people don't tend to live in these areas because of the very harsh conditions. So some people sort of think, well, should we bother protecting it then? Um, well, yeah, we should, okay? Um, these areas of remoteness, these wilderness areas, um, they can't just look after themselves. Um, they're still subject to, to damage due to uh, to climate change. They're still subject to damage due to deforestation, um, and they can have a real significant knock-on effect um, on the whole planet. So beyond just the tiger forest, um, if they end up getting in, in, in trouble, you know this tiger. It's a very fragile ecosystem. Um, it takes a very long time to recover from damage. Uh, plants grow very slowly um, because of the long, cold winters and the lack of nutrients, um, and so. You know, if if you get any kind of one small issue um, in the tiger, then it can kind of expand and become a, a very large, uh, very large problem. So we do uh, need to protect the the tiger uh, due to its you know its sensitivity, um, its fragility, um, and all the kind of uh, negative impacts that it that could happen if we don't protect it. Not just for the tiger itself, but also on a global scale. 
So, um, what can we do? What are national parks uh, and wilderness areas? Well, these are the two strategies for today's lesson. National parks and wilderness areas. Okay, now you get these in, in Canada, in the Canadian boreal forest, uh, you get both. You get national parks and you get wilderness areas. Now, a national park is mostly a, a, an area that's kind of in its national, uh, sorry, national, in its natural state, um, and it's managed to protect biodiversity uh, and to promote leisure. So they actually encourage people to go and visit these areas. They're bigger than a thousand hectares in size. There's legal protection um, against certain types of commercial development. So if you say an area, you outline an area as being a national park, it's going to be over a thousand hectares in size, and it will be um, have, it will have legal protection so you can't just build anything on it um, and it'll have rangers that kind of monitor the area and that work in the national park um, ensuring it's, um, it's safe. then you've got wilderness areas okay, um, which are kind of similar so they're areas that are protected, uh, are protected um, when you can't build uh, in them um, but they've got even less human activity than national parks, so they tend to be even more uh, remote. Um, and actually, what the rangers do in wilderness areas is they do something called active ecosystem management, which is where they will interfere with some of the natural processes in the ecosystem if it means, in the long term, the um, the wilderness area will be protected. Um, so, for instance, um, in Canada, they once had to call elk. So, elk, this picture at the bottom here, is a type of deer. And they worked out that there were too many of these deer um, because there weren't enough things eating them. So there weren't enough um, birds, there weren't enough wolves, um, there weren't enough mountain lions eating these elk. Um, so the elk were eating too many of the tree saplings, so not enough of these trees were being grown. So they knew that, well, what they needed to do to encourage the tree growth would be they needed to kill some of these elk um, to allow the ecosystem in it to, to balance. Uh, and we call that cull, uh, done in that very specific way. So national parks and wilderness areas, essentially areas of the, the boreal forest that are, um, that are kind of outlined as areas that are protected. So they have legal protection. Um, certain types of commercial activity can't be built in them, um, or certainly very limited amounts. Um, they often have rangers working within them. Um, and in the case of wilderness areas, you will get some active ecosystem management. But they're not hard to, uh, sorry, they are difficult to, to make sure that they always work, okay? Um, and one of the first kind of key issues is just the size, all right? Remember, this is one of the biggest, if not, well, the biggest biome on Earth, okay? The boreal forest is massive. Canada is massive. Russia is massive, all right? So to really try and manage a big wilderness area or a big national park, you've got a big job on your hands. And even though they are massive, uh, you could argue that they aren't uh, massive enough. All right. Um, if you look at this map of Canada here, um, much of this area of Canada would be classified as tiger forest, but the national parks um, are just these bits, bits in the peach colour. Okay. Um, so you know, if you if you're a big predator, which you aren't, but if you're a big predator um, like a, like a grizzly bear or something, um, then you need these large areas. Uh, to, to roam and they do roam in these large areas but a bird doesn't know that it's come to the end of the of the border with the national park and that it's about to leave an area of protection um, so it's quite hard to protect the whole ecosystem because of some of these migratory patterns um, of certain animals or the very large spaces that uh, the animals uh, require uh, that means that they might move out of these areas of protection um, without necessarily meaning to Tourism is also a real challenge in the tiger uh, and making sure that these national parks um, are not kind of uh, overrun with, um, with uh, threats. Now, it's ironic because um, people actively go to national parks. Um, they are a, a centre of tourism um, and they need to be so that the wealth can be generated and reinvested back into managing uh, the, uh, the national parks. Uh, but also, they might not mean to, but tourists do bring disadvantages, uh, namely obviously just litter, um, but also just some of the infrastructure that's required to support tourists um, can cause problems. So the fact that you've got to build roads through the, um, through the, um, through the forest, okay, that's going to disturb um, certain animals' kind of moving patterns. All right? You might get uh, roadkill. Um, 
you're also going to have air pollution um, from some of the kind of tourist destinations. I put some images on the slide here of a, um, a place in Canada um, called the Banff, Banff National Park. And very, very famous photograph um, of an area called, I think this is Lake Louise, or it might be called Moraine Lake, uh, but a very famous area in, in Canada that you can go and visit. Uh, Lake Louise, I think that is. Um, and you can actually see the town of Banff on this bottom image here. So a lovely place to visit. Um, but as I said, some of those tourists will bring uh, disadvantages with them, threats with them. Um, and um, that is one of the reasons, therefore, why it's hard to achieve success in, in national parks. Um, I've got a, a picture of me, um, as I always show each year, each year at this, um, standing on this lake, um, being in a, giving you an example of what not to do as a tourist. Um, so this is in the, in the winter where the ice is, is frozen. There's warnings for, for against tourists, but people will still do daft things uh, like this. Um, there's a couple of other reasons why um, it's a challenge, and then that is kind of money and pressure. Um, so, you know, people would argue that actually, no, we should be felling parts of the tiger forest, and we should be accessing the, the bitumen or the oil that's uh, in the tar sands below. Um, that's more lucrative, that provides more jobs, it brings in more income than tourism. So we should scrap the uh, national parks and have this instead. Um, and as I've mentioned already, this kind of idea that um, just because one area is, is protected doesn't mean that it's going to be protected from the disadvantages that are created in, uh, in neighbouring areas. Um, so there's a place called the Wood Buffalo National Park, so this one here, and that's in Canada. And near there, in, this, in these surrounding areas, there is tar sand mining. So although this is a protected national park, you've got the uh, tar sands mining in the surrounding areas, okay? And what's happening is some of, the, some of the rivers are therefore being polluted quite heavily, quite severely, and those rivers are flowing into the Wood Buffalo National Park, okay? So it's this transboundary pollution um, that um, you, you can't avoid by having a national park or a wilderness area, okay? It's the same with, with forms of atmospheric pollution as well. Okay, so what I need you to do for today's task is I need you to do um, on, on Microsoft Word or in email or directly into Show My Homework, if you can do that, um, these questions. And I want you to type out the question uh, for me, please, um, and then answer it underneath. So for now, I would like you to do questions one and then the two sub-questions, question two and uh, question three. All right? Um, and you can do all of those um, by... Um, the uh, first page on today's information uh, booklet, all right, on today's information sheet, all right, which looks like this. Okay, so you've got that sheet that you can don't. No, it doesn't look like that. Um, one second. Oh, I haven't saved it. I don't think. Never mind. Um, it's the one that's on show my homework. If you read that first that first page, um, you should therefore be able to do these first three questions. Once you've done the first three questions, um, well, pause the video, do the first three questions, um, email me if you need any help, and then once you've done the first three, press play on the video, and then we'll carry on. Okay, now that you've pressed play again, and you've done the first three questions um, on, on Word, and, you, and you're gonna share this with me on OneDrive or via email later on, um, I'd like us to kind of uh, answer this last question, and this, this was part of the last objective as well, which is to explain why there are conflicting views um, about protecting the tiger, okay? Now, um, there are always going to be differing opinions on what to do in the tiger forest, um, and it's because people have different vested interests, okay? Um, people's opinions often um, are shaped by what they do, uh, what their job is, what their role in society is, um, and how it will affect them. So if you're living in an indigenous um, community in the Canadian tiger or the Russian tiger, or you're an environmentalist or you're a climate change scientist, then your interests um, and desires are going to be very different to those of um, a tar sands chief executive uh, company officer um, or a local person who works in a tar sand industry, um, for, for instance. So because people have different vested interests, uh, they also have different opinions about what should and shouldn't be done. 
And that's why we have these um, diverging uh, opinions on whether we should carry on exploiting the tiger for all those uh, resources, so for hydroelectric power, for minerals, for uh, wood, for uh, pulp to turn into to paper, for the tar sands, so the, the oil supplies, um, or whether we should uh, protect them uh, and instead preserve biodiversity and try and reduce climate change. So you're always going to get them, them diverging opinions. Um, and on the second page of the information uh, book, uh, sheet for today's lesson, you've got um, several different reasons uh, why some people would argue you should conserve biodiversity and, and protect the tiger. Um, and then you've got several reasons why people believe you should exploit the tiger. So what I would like you to do is take a highlighter pen or uh, something to that effect if you've got this printed out. If not, don't worry. And I'd like to read that second page in full from top to bottom. Okay. Um, and once you've done that, I'd like you to have a go at answering question four. Now, it's really important that you do look at the command words. You look at how many wor uh, marks it's worth in brackets um, before you attempt the questions. Please proofread your work. And then once you've done that, you can send it to me again via OneDrive or via email. So to be clear, the submission task for today's lesson is not educate, it's not a show my homework quiz, um, it's these four, uh, four or five questions that I would like you to do using Office 365 and share that with me uh, online or via email. If you've got any questions or issues, uh, do please uh, let me know. But otherwise, um, that is it and I will see many of you next week. Thank you.